Well, thanks for joining us for our final instalment of Sunday Arvo Sermons with Pastor E, where we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark, the series that I've titled, Even the Wind and the Waves Obey Him. And this last few weeks, we've been taking a road trip to Easter, and we're about to arrive Easter Sunday. And in fact, if you're watching this, then Easter Sunday has arrived. And I've titled this message on Mark chapter 16, including Peter. That is the title. So just to recap what happened at the end of Mark 15, this is important in setting up Mark chapter 16. And Mark chapter 15 finishes with the burial of Jesus, which I'm reading from verse 42. This all happened on Friday the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph was an honoured member of the high council and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead, so he called for the Roman officer and asked if he had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead, so Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. Joseph bought a long sheet of linen cloth. Then he took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in the cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone in front of the entrance. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where Jesus' body was laid. That is how chapter 15 finishes. That was verse 47. And that is a very important detail that Mark has included there. Because what we're looking at here is what I'm calling, and many scholars far more august than me, calling compelling evidence for the resurrection. We're not claiming this is proof of anything, but it is compelling evidence that is reported in the Gospel of Mark through the eyewitness account of Peter and others following Jesus. So the first item of compelling evidence that we have right here is that two of the women following Jesus saw where his body was laid. And that's important for any of those criticisms that suggest that these women in their grief and perhaps uh, they were so upset they went to the wrong tomb and, and they thought that it was empty because they were at the wrong tomb. Well, that's not the case at all. Mark confidently states that these two women saw where Jesus' body was laid. And they're not going to get that wrong. So we begin Mark chapter 16. From verse 1, Mark writes, Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? Very good question. I've actually had the privilege of traveling through Israel and seeing these stones that were used to close up the tombs. And I must admit, when I first read the gospel and and until I'd seen what these tombs looked like, Um, I had this image of this great boulder just sort of clogging up the entrance of this cave-like structure. And then rolling the stone away simply meant rolling this big boulder away and it kind of rolls off to who knows where. Well, that's not the case. They actually have this this, um, stone which is basically shaped like a a giant disc and it's got a slot that it, it rolls back and forth on. So when you roll the stone into place, it locks in into place and covers up that tomb completely. But when it's rolled away, it is rolled out of the way of the entrance, but it's still just locked in right next to the tomb, ready to be rolled in place again. So they're asking a very valid question, these women. Who's going to roll this stone away? We don't have the the strength for that. We don't think. But verse 4, Mark writes, But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. The stone was rolled away. 
This is the second item of compelling evidence, this large stone. So this body that had been laid there on the Friday night, and already the stones rolled away. That wasn't meant to happen. Not when there's a body freshly laid in that tomb. And not when there was no one yet to anoint the body for, for burial. So the third item of compelling evidence for the resurrection is that Jesus was a real person who is part of human history. He's not this mystical, spiritual guru who just sort of drifts in and floats in and can't really be tied down to any particular um, time frame in history. Quite the opposite. Have a look at how Mark identifies Jesus as a real human being who entered into human history. Verse 5, when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Did you hear that? Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth was a real town, a very small town, very insignificant. In fact, so insignificant that the Romans didn't even register it in the census. But archaeologists have have shown beyond doubt that Nazareth is a real town. Nazareth survives today. It is now a, a city of one million plus people. So it's no longer an insignificant town. So this was Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth, no, it wasn't the place where he was born, but it was the place where he grew up as a young lad. So Mark's describing him as Jesus of Nazareth because that's what the angel said, but also because Mark wants us to know, without a doubt, that he was a real person who lived in a real town, in a real part of the world. And he says, you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. So he's verifying this is the right tomb. This is that Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, he was crucified. But then the angel continues, he isn't here. This is where it is really stunning news for these women. He is risen from the dead. And that is the first announcement, that Jesus has risen from the dead. And that announcement has been repeated throughout history millions of times, and we're repeating it again today. Hallelujah! Jesus is risen from the dead. And the angel continues, Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples including Peter. That's very important, and we will touch on that later. Including Peter. Tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. So, again, Peter, a real um, person in history. Peter, who, who was so important among the disciples. And then the angel declares that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee, another real place. Galilee is a part of Israel today. And the angel promises, you will see him there, just as he told you before he died. So the eyewitnesses report that this angel, this, this being that appeared to them, um, verified that what Jesus said would happen, would happen. So verse 8, the women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. So Mark includes that there, that this picture of these women just, just running, and perhaps there are people along the way saying, what's wrong, what's, what's happening? And they just didn't stop. They just didn't have the words. They just didn't want to uh, waste any time. And besides, they were in fear. They didn't know what this would mean, whether it meant they would be uh, in some sort of danger from the authorities. We don't know, but they were in fear. But then Mark continues. Then they briefly reported all this to Peter and his companions. Afterwards, Jesus himself sent them out from east to west with the sacred and unfailing message of salvation that gives eternal life. So... The fourth item of compelling evidence that we've just been discussing here is that the first witness of the resurrection of Jesus was a woman. And it was a group of women. 
Now, in our culture, in our society today, uh, there is no reason, apart from people who have particularly uh, sexist views, people who degrade women, people who feel that women are somehow inferior, uh, there's, there are people, there's no denying that, who have that view of women. But that's not how our legal system views women. The testimony of a woman is as valid as a man's in our Western society. However, that was not the case in ancient Middle Eastern culture. And in this culture, the Hebrew people, at that time, uh, women's testimony was not considered able to stand up in court. So you might wonder, well, why is that compelling evidence? Well, it's, this is why. Because if you were going to invent a religion in ancient Israel at that time, would you really, if you're going to concoct some sort of new cult or religion, would you base the, the pivotal key part of your religion on the testimony of a woman? I, I doubt it. But this, in fact, serves as very powerful evidence that not only did Jesus have a radical view of women, but also that this really is compelling evidence. The fact that Jesus dares to entrust uh, the truth of what has happened to the testimony of a woman shows that Jesus is just ultimately confident that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and, and no one's bias or prejudice, prejudice uh, against uh, women is going to halt the progress of this and history has proven that to be true. Verse 9. After Jesus rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. So not only that, that she was a woman, also that she was a woman with a past. Seven demons had been cast out of her. She went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. But when she told them that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they didn't believe her. And we're not surprised uh, to hear that, given the culture of the day as we have discussed it. Verse 12, afterward he appeared in a different form to two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem into the country. And I believe that's the story that's reported in Luke chapter 24, the road to Emmaus. They rushed back to tell the others, but no one believed them either. Verse 14, still later he appeared to the 11 disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for, for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. And then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name and they will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down in the place of honour at God's right hand. And the disciples went everywhere and preached, and the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. So finally, the last item of compelling evidence that I want to, in fact, conclude on here is the way Peter was singled out. This again brings great resolution to the story. And it's really delivered in a way that only God, I believe, could, could orchestrate. So the women see the angel sitting there in the empty tomb where the body of Jesus no longer lies. And the angel, of course, says, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. 
Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. So why is it important that he, he notes that Peter needs to be included? Well, remember how it ended for Peter just before the crucifixion where he let Jesus down. He, he had a desire to always stand with Jesus and, and to never, never let him down. And yet right in that hour of testing, when the rooster crowed, Peter realised he had let Jesus down by denying him. And he wept bitterly and he no doubt heard about what happened to Judas, that Judas had been overcome by grief and guilt and uh, had taken his own life. And um, Peter probably f had to wrestle with, with similar thoughts. Who knows? But we know that Peter felt absolutely terrible. And Peter appeared to, to um, be in a place of, of limbo, wondering if he had disqualified himself from being a follower of Jesus. So imagine what that was like to Peter's ears. The angel specifically singled out Peter. It's as though Jesus from beyond the grave, and in fact, now in his resurrected form, is calling out to Peter and saying, Peter, you're not out of the game. You're not forgotten. I'm not finished with you. You still belong to me. Isn't that just the way God so often works? We, like Peter, feel that we have... have completely um, blown it and disqualified ourselves and yet we hear news um, from uh, from uh, a far country perhaps or we hear surprising news and in amongst it we we might respond by saying well that's great I would love to still be part of that and then we hear Jesus calling us and saying yes including you you're still part of this. I really hope that this is speaking to someone out there, that if, if they are feeling like Peter felt, that they've let Jesus down too many times, they've denied him, they've blown it, and they perhaps feel that they can never be what Jesus has called them to be. I believe that Jesus is calling you today, and he's including you, he's singling you out and saying, you are still part of this. Trust me. So that angel, you can still hear his voice echoing. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you before he died. So my final question is, are you compelled by this evidence? Jesus of Nazareth was crucified on Friday, where he was laid in a tomb. But by the Sunday morning, the stone of that tomb had been rolled away. His body was no longer there. He had risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Jesus has risen. Jesus is alive today. God bless you.